welcome back students now in this video let's discuss about uterine fibroids these fibroids are they benign tumors or malignant tumors the first question is are they benign in nature or malignant in nature they are benign tumors okay well and good so they are the tumors arising from which cells fibroids are tumors from myometrial cells or muscle cells we all know that uterus is made up of three layers the endometrium myometrium and perimetrium the fibroids are arising from the myometrial cell that one myometrial cell now it's undergoing rapid division because of certain mutations and it is forming the fibroid okay well and good now let's see some important points fibroids are most common benign tumors in females yeah they are most common how common see by 50 years of age almost 80% of the females almost 80% of the females by 50 years of age will have fibroids they may not be symptomatic but asymptomatically a small size fibroid can be there so they are that much common 80% of the females will have by 50 years of age it's the most common pelvic tumor please remember it's the most common benign solid tumors in a female as well as they are the most common pelvic tumors now fibroids are dash tumors and dash around it what does i mean by see fibroids are monoclonal tumors monoclonal tumors what does i mean by monoclonal in the sense it's the one myometrial cell okay one myometrial cell or one muscle cell it have gone rapid division and the whole tumor is formed from that cell so they are monoclonal in nature and these fibroids if you can see these fibroids they are surrounded by a capsule is it going to be a true capsule no it's a pseudo capsule so fibroids are monoclonal tumors they are monoclonal tumors and there is a pseudo capsule pseudo capsule is present around these tumors okay well and good now fibroids have dash appearance on cross section if you have done the cross section now you can clearly see here that these fibroids they are having this world appearance okay so world appearance is seen in the cross section of a fibroid okay well and good it is a dash dependent tumor see these fibroids for their growth they depend on estrogen and progesterone so i can say that fibroids are estrogen and progesterone dependent tumor okay yes most common age group affected is so these fibroids are they going to be a seen in a young female or reproductive age group female or a post menopausal female these fibroids okay try to understand something like this usually inside a uterus what should be growing a baby should be growing okay uterus is for the growth of the baby now if a female is not letting the uterus to grow a baby then what this uterus is doing you know this uterus is making its own baby what does i mean by so if a female is not getting conceived okay if she is not getting conceived like something like in a nulli nulli paras female now in these females especially in nulli paras females you can have this fibroids and that to what age group usually a female should have to like you know usually females marry by age of 25 something like that and she is going to get conceived within the one year so by 26 years she will be normally a uh, females can be pregnant but she is not getting conceived uterus is waiting it will wait for one year two year three year and it will wait for 10 years just think like that but still she is not getting conceived now 26 plus 10 36 now what uterus is doing uterus is making its own baby so it's wait, it have waited for 10 years now it's making its own baby by 35 to 40 years of the time so what does i am what i am trying to put into your mind is if nothing is growing inside the uterus uterus is making its own baby and that to what age group 35 to 40 years reproductive age group females okay so in a reproductive age group females these fibroids are more common okay well and good fibroids are most commonly seen in dash female which females are at risk of getting these fibroids those females who are not making a baby that females so nulli paras females nulli paras females are at risk of developing the fibroid and obese females also at risk of developing a 
fibroid why obese females are at a risk of developing a fibroid guys it's very simple obese female means lot of fat is present on them if there is a lot of fat lot of androgens are getting converted into estrogen so lot of peripheral aromatization is happening if there is a lot of estrogen and that estrogen is just like a nutrition for a fibroid to grow why because fibroids are estrogen and progesterone dependent tumors so obese females they are at a risk of developing these fibroids okay now smoking and increased parity are protective it's very much clear that increased parity is a protective why because increased parity means many many number of babies too much number of babies so if too many babies are growing inside the uterus so uterus don't need to grow something inside it so something like that increased parity is a protective factor as well as smoking why smoking is a protective factor why because smoking inhibits aromatase enzyme if smoking inhibits aromatase there is no peripheral conversion happening androgens are not getting converted into estrogens see for the conversion of for the conversion of androgen to estrogen there should be an enzyme called aromatase aromatase okay this enzyme is functioning for the conversion of androgens to estrogens smoking inhibits smoking inhibits aromatase so whenever there is no aromatase androgens are not getting converted into estrogen so whenever the estrogens are going down that is something good here okay so smoking is a protective factor also remember that smoking is a protective factor for which gynecological cancer endometrial cancer smoking is a protective factor for endometrial cancer also why because even for endometrial cancer the hyperestrogenic states are a risk factor okay now first degree lithium have dash times risk of getting a fibroid what does i mean by there is a female there is a female now her first degree relatives like mother or sister if they have fibroids means then how many times that this female is more likely to get a fibroid almost two and a half times okay so 2.5 times increase risk of getting a fibroid if a one of her first degree relative is having such fibroids now what are the chromosomal abnormalities associated see this fibroids this tumors first of all why these tumors are there because of some gene mutation because of some chromosomal abnormality so which chromosomal abnormality is leading to develop these fibroids translocation 1214 important okay let me show you translocation 1214 deletion of chromosome number 7 and trisomy 12 they are associated with the uterine fibroids and gene mutations specific gene mutations like hmga2 gene mutation and med 12 gene mutation they are associated with the uterine fibroids and also remember that fibroids 40% of the time 40% of the time they are associated with some chromosomal abnormalities we have discussed everything but please remember guys if someone ask you fibroid it's a capsulated tumor then what you are going to answer yes why because it's having a pseudo capsule so can we call it as a capsulated tumor no don't answer it why because this is not a true capsule it's a false capsule or pseudo capsule so though it is covered by a pseudo capsule we shouldn't call it as a capsulated tumor okay and it is monoclonal in nature old appearance we have discussed it's both progesterone and estrogen dependent tumor and most commonly this is going to be seen somewhere around 35 to 40 or 35 to 45 years of age if we have discussed and nulli parity is a risk factor and that's going to be seen most commonly in our obese females as they are having lot of estrogen in their body okay we have completed all this now let's see fibroids create a hyperestrogenic environment why fibroids need hyperestrogenic environment why because it's a smooth muscle cell of a uterus we all know to grow uterus we need these estrogens for uterine de development for uterine growth we need estrogens so these tumors they are rapidly like you no know, they are growing so they need estrogen as a nutrition so these fibroids have certain mechanisms by which they maintain the hyperestrogenic state so what these fibroids are doing let's see the mechanism number 1 is these fibroids are having lots of estrogen receptors okay when compared to a normal myometrial cell these fibroid cells are having lots and lots of estrogen so they can take up lot of estrogen okay so lots of estrogen receptors are there for estradiol binding that's an important mechanism and one more important mechanism is 
they don't allow they don't allow the conversion of okay less conversion they don't allow the conversion of e2 into e1 why because e2 is more potent they are not allowing the conversion of e2 into e1 so that they are having this more potent e2 available for them okay so that's an important mechanism and one more I'll, like you know this is going to be like you know a question fibroids contain an enzyme called cytochrome p450 aromatase fibroids contain this enzyme and what these fibroids are doing with the help of this aromatase enzyme they are converting they are converting androgens into estrogens so they are producing estrogens by themselves why because androgens are getting converted into estrogens because of this p450 aromatase enzyme so there is this too much amount of estrogen production and that will be a favorable state for the fibroid to grow so these are the main mechanisms by which the fibroids are maintaining a hyperestrogenic state okay let's continue now let's see what are the different types of fibroids you can have first here i just want to mention that there are mainly three different types of fibroids how many types will be there there are three different types of fibroids what are they intramural fibroid what does i mean by a intramural fibroid means a fibroid which have present which is present in the myometrium it's totally present in the wall okay it's totally present it's totally localized to the wall and that's the first type intramural type the second type of fibroid is the one which is coming into the uterine cavity if you can see here this is the second type which is called as a submucous fibroid where the fibroid is moving into the uterine cavity and there is one more variant which is called as a subserous fibroid okay a sub a serous fibroid where the fibroid is moving out okay it's coming out of the uterus it's coming outside the uterus okay for example something like this this is a, a sub serous fibroid you can say so major three different types of fibroid are intramural fibroid submucous fibroid and sub serous fibroid important point to be noted here is all fibroids begin as all the fibroids they begin as intramural fibroids only they begin as an intramural fibroid and they may become a submucous fibroid and they can become a subserous fibroid okay depend on the movement if they if it is moving inside the uterine cavity it will become submucous if it is moving outside okay of the uterus it will it will become subserous fibroid now still according to the figo there are almost eight different types of uh, fibroids now let's see one by one please concentrate here see submucous fibroids are further divided into 0 1 and 2 we all know submucous fibroid means it should be coming into the cavity or towards the cavity now please concentrate here that 0 okay 0 it is totally intracavity absolutely it is intracavity and with a peduncle okay there is this peduncle and that too this is 100% intracavity now this 1 and 2 are they submucous fibroids or not yes they are coming into the uterine cavity but please concentrate here one it's more than 50% of the fibroid if you concentrate here on like in the fibroid which is like you know given the number one it's more than 50% okay more than 50% of the fibroid is into the uterine cavity and if you can concentrate on the two like you know fibroid which was denoted with the number two less than 50% is present in the uterine cavity so 0 1 and 2 all of them are submucous fibroids okay well and good now if you see 3 number 3 it's now it like you know it's going into the wall okay now like you know they are giving the number according to the like you know whether it was present in the uterine cavity or is present like you know almost in the subserous area starting from 0 going till to 8 we are moving from inside of the uterine cavity to the outside so this is how the number system was given zero is completely inside and 8 8 will be like no some uh, till 7 7 will be completely outside why right? because 8 is something almost like you know outside detached from the like uterus we are going to discuss don't worry so the number system was given in such a way zero will be completely inside the uterine cavity one will be coming into like you know little bit into the uterine wall two will be coming little bit into the uterine wall three three four five six like you know we are moving 
towards the outside that's what i'm trying to put into your mind okay well and good see please co concentrate here the fibroid number 3 this is something very much important this is what they are going to ask you in the exam they will say that there is a fibroid in the uterine wall and that too this fibroid is just coming into contact with the uterine endometrium just touching the uterine endometrium just touching uterine endometrium please concentrate here just coming into contact with the uterine endometrium so it is which type so it's like you know grade 3 okay so it just contacts the endometrium but 100% is intramural in nature so this is how you have to keep in mind and like you know if they ask you total intramural fibroid without not even touching to the endometrium it's completely enclosed in the myometrium is type 4 so it's absolutely intramural fibroid something like that so this is how you have to like you know they the like you know grades was given okay so well and good if they ask you please concentrate if they are talking about a subserous fibroid which is having a peduncle see this is absolutely a subserous fibroid and it is also having a peduncle to it now it is of which grade it is grade number 7 so pedunculated subserous fibroid is grade 7 and once please concentrate guys if this peduncle if it's get detached okay if this fibroid if it's getting detached and now this fibroid is going into the like you know uh, the peritoneal cavity and it's getting attached to the peritoneum or it's getting lodged onto the omentum and there it is growing there it is growing on the like omentum or the peritoneal cavity now you can see that there is a fibroid which was given a number from 2 to 5 so these fibroids they are extending from the uterine cavity which means they are submucous as well as they are subserosal it's a fibroid which is a submucous and it is having intramural part as well as they are having a subserosal part now these fibroids are known as hybrid fibroids okay they are known as a hybrids which are having intramural part submucous part and they are also having the subserosal part so these fibroids are known as hybrid fibroids so they will be given a double number with a hyphen 2 to 5 so 8 so we have already discussed that if once if the fibroid is detached from the uterus and if it is growing somewhere in the abdominal cavity then they are known as wandering fibroids or parasitic fibroids. So we have discussed all the different types of fibroids according to the FICO. So all these are the classification for the fibroids. Now let's continue with the let's continue. Now here what we are seeing is the hysteroscopic images for the uterine fibroid. Now Please concentrate in this image number 1. Here what we are seeing is a fibroid which is absolutely intracavitary in nature. It's absolutely intracavitary but it's having a peduncle attached to it. So pedunculated intracavitary fibroid is grade 0 there is no doubt. Now in the image number 2 what you can see is there is a fibroid and some part is coming some part is coming into the uterine cavity. So less than 50% is intramural but much amount of fibroid much amount of fibroid it is coming into the uterine cavity so then this is a grade 1 fibroid this is a grade 1 fibroid where less than 50% is inside and more than 50% is coming into the cavity now please concentrate on the image number 3 where you can see a very small portion of fibroid a very small portion is coming into the cavity which means a much larger chunk is present in the wall so it is grade 2 fibroid where more than 50 percent is present in the wall more than 50 percent is intramural but a small part is protruding into the cavity so these are the grades grade 0 1 and 2 you please concentrate on the image 4 you should say this is a place where more than like you know more fibroid like you know, more than 50 percent of the fibroid is coming into the uterine cavity which means it is a grade a one fibroid okay grade one fibroid which means like you know, most of the fibroid is in the cavity so it is a grade one fibroid so please concentrate on the image number five where you can see okay this is not a hysteroscopic image this is a laparoscopic image where you can see there are outgrowths from the uterus okay the, you can see a very much big outgrowths are coming out into the abdominal cavity okay into the pelvic cavity so these are the uh, fibroids so which fibroids are they are they pedunculated no 
have they detached from the uterine wall no so they are which type they are a sub serosal fibroid okay they are sub serosal fibroid okay they are they, oh, sorry they are not sub serosal pedunculated why because they are not having the peduncle as like you know uh, much amount of the fibroid it's coming into the pelvic cavity now they are sub serous fibroid but less than 50 percent is intramural okay right? they are less part less part is present inside the uterine wall much part bigger chunk is present in the pelvic cavity so they are sub serous and less than 50 percent is intramural so they are a type 6 fibroid okay they are type or grade 6 fibroid so these are different images just to I can give you an idea. So classification about different grades of fibroids is completed. Now after this, let's discuss about the clinical features. Okay. Now if a like first of all, let's discuss about the uh, difference between a pseudo fibroid and a true fibroid. So we have seen different grades of fibroids, and we have seen different types of fibroids also. Like you know, uh, intramural fibroid, sub serous fibroid, and a sub mucous fibroid. Now the question is, what's the difference between a pseudo broad ligament fibroid and a true broad ligament fibroid? In the name itself, it's very clear. It's a broad ligament fibroid, which means it is present in the broad ligament. There is no doubt. If it's a true broad ligament fibroid, it have originated in the broad ligament itself. It have originated in the broad ligament itself. So a true broad ligament fibroid is such, if it have originated in the broad ligament, then we are going to call it as a true broad ligament fibroid now what is a pseudo broad ligament fibroid then a pseudo broad ligament fibroid it's actually arising from the uterus and that too it's a sub serosal fibroid see it's a sub serosal fibroid and now it is protruding it's coming into the broad ligament so pseudo broad ligament fibroids they are actually a sub serosal fibroids and if they protrude into the broad ligament and if they are just looking like a broad ligament fibroid then we are going to call it as a pseudo broad ligament fibroid so how we are going to differentiate whether it's a pseudo broad ligament fibroid or a true broad ligament fibroid grossly how we are going to differentiate is the true broad ligament fibroid they are going to lie they are going to lie lateral to the ureters please concentrate in this image what i am highlighting right now it's a ureter okay it's a ureter now i'm just taking a line exactly to a ureter please take this line okay now if it is a true broad ligament fibroid it is going to lie mostly lateral to the ureter if it is a pseudo broad ligament fibroid then it is going to lie medial to the ureter so this is how they will happen most of the time so true broad ligament fibroids how to identify they are lying lateral to the ureter if it is a pseudo broad ligament fibroid they are lying medial to the ureter so this is how we are going to differentiate between them an important point is see if a female is having this fibroid usually she is going to have anemia we will see why there is anemia we are going to discuss don't worry but a pseudo broad ligament fibroids are the ones which are usually associated with a polycythemia mcq okay a pseudo broad ligament fibroid like you know, why means like you know these fibroids um, they are going to compress the like you know these ureters and compression of these ureters will cause you know a hydronephrosis and a hydronephrosis is a condition which can cause like you know increase erythropoietin levels and that erythropoietin can cause polycythemia that's a total different thing but please remember broad ligament fibroids are the ones which are associated with the polycythemia but the other fibroids are usually associated with anemia and the female is going to be more fatty that we will see in the clinical features okay let's continue now effects on fibroids let's see before discussing the risk factors you should know this menopause shrinks the size of the fibroid we know during menopause there is atrophy of the urogenital system in a female that's a true so this fibroid is nothing but a part of uterus so during menopause a fibroid will shrink this is something very much important for the mcqs this is something very much important in the management while we are discussing management there we will say you know if there is asymptomatic fibroid or even if there is a symptomatic fibroid in a menopausal age group women we are not going to treat it much why because that menopause itself will shrink the size of the fibroid so this is something important and ocps have no effect on fibroid guys this is a very much important point remember 
using contraceptives using hormonal contraceptives like oral contraceptive pills is a risk factor for developing a fibroid using ocps it's a risk factor for developing a fibroid take my statement i'm repeating using hormonal contraceptives on a long term basis is a risk factor for developing this fibroids why because ocps are nothing but estrogen and progesterone if you are taking this estrogen and progesterone for so long duration that causes a fibroid yeah hyperestrogenic state fibroid true but once if there is a fibroid see once if there is a fibroid then taking oral contraceptive pills doesn't increases the size of the fibroid this is something important before fibroid ocps are a risk factor but once if you have fibroids you know we are going to treat the fibroids with the ocps now you will think like sir ocps are a risk factor for fibroid you are saying that but you can also ask me then if ocps are a risk factor for fibroid then why we are using the ocps for the treatment of fibroid why because ocps are having no effect on fibroid which means once if there is a fibroid if you use this oral contraceptive pills they doesn't increase the size of the fibroid okay this is very much important again i am going to like you know in detail explain it when i am discussing the management of the fibroid now pregnancy pregnancy have no effect on the fibroid okay so during pregnancy they don't cause any changes in the fibroid okay they don't shrink the size of the fibroid or they doesn't increase the size of the fibroid that's something important now protective factors so smoking is a protective factor why smoking is a protective factor we have discussed that smoking inhibits the enzyme aromatase so there is no peripheral aromatization okay well and good physical exercise is a protective factor that decreases the adipose tissue on the female that decreases the peripheral aromatization something good and pregnancy is a protective factor why because nulliparous females nulliparous females are at a risk multiparous female means that's something good if she is a multiparous female like you know she is having more number of pregnancies more number of pregnancies means more number of uh, breaks more number of gestational amenorrhea like more months of lactational amenorrhea will be there so during that states there is decrease estrogenic stimulation there is decrease estrogenic stimulation of the uterus so that's something good so protective factors are smoking healthy diet physical exercise pregnancy they all can be a protective factors now after this let's see what are the risk factors guys these are very much important mcqs you can expect at least one mcq from the risk factor now let's see the age 30 to 40 40 group like no 35 40 or like no 35 to 45 so reproductive age group women reproductive age group women they are at risk of developing this fibroids true race and genetics like you know these are also a risk factor why because like you know which race is going to have this fibroids more it's a african like you know race african women okay the black women okay black women are africans so black women they are at a, like you know a risk of getting this more number of fibroids and we have also seen that you know certain chromosomal abnormalities like you know um, a translocation 12 14 like you know trisomy 12 deletion of chromosome number 7 they are implicated with the development of a fibroid so race and genetics early menarch okay early menarch means too much amount of estrogen stimulation early menarch she is supposed to have her periods by 12 years of age or 13 years of age what if she is having her periods by 8 years of age extra duration of estrogenic stimulation for the uterus so extra estrogenic stimulation so that can cause a tumor inside the uterus so early menarche is a risk factor nulliparity is a risk factor we have discussed like no if uterus is not growing like no if the uterus is not making a baby it will make a baby for itself so that's a nulliparous uterus is a risk factor for fibroid and use of hormonal contraceptives i have said using hormonal contraceptives on a long term basis is a risk factor for developing fibroid but once if you have a fibroid we can again going to treat that fibroid by using oral contraceptive pills okay that's we will discuss again don't worry now family risk if a first degree relative is having this fibroid then this current female is going to have a likely chance of getting this fibroid by 2.5 times now obesity is a risk factor uh, risk factor we have discussed fat females too much amount of like you know peripheral aromatization and lifestyle see red red meat consumers they like you know that females who are consuming this red meat so they are at a risk of getting this fibroid and alcohol like you know consumers are also at a risk of getting this fibroid but important point is smoking is a protective factor smoking is a protective factor both for 
in, like you know this is a uterine fibroids as well as endometrial cancer so in these both conditions the smoking is a protective factor now let's continue with the clinical features if a female is having these fibroids then how she is going to present so the presentation most common presentation is asymptomatic that most of the time most of the time she doesn't even know that she is having a fibroid okay we have we have discussed like you know these are very much common by 50 years of age 80 percent of the females will have this fibroid they can be a very small fibroid okay and that too it's asymptomatic if it's very small that's going to be absolutely asymptomatic so most common presentation is asymptomatic okay that's something very much important if at all there is a symptom if at all there is a symptom then the most common symptom is menorrhagia most common presentation is asymptomatic if at all there is a symptom the most common symptom is going to be menorrhagia and what does it mean by menorrhagia too much amount of bleeding or heavy menstrual bleeding i can say now why there is heavy menstrual bleeding guys please understand that for example if this is the uterine cavity this is the uterine a cavity which is lined with the endometrium now my question is if there is a submucous fibroid i am just saying if there is a submucous fibroid if there is a big submucous fibroid now the endometrium is growing even on the fibroid so this fibroids what they are doing they are increasing the surface area for the endometrium if there is a fibroid it increases the surface area for the endometrium to grow if there is more surface area more endometrium is growing if there is more endometrium more endometrial shedding will happen during menses if there is more endometrial shedding that is nothing but menorrhagia too much amount of menses so how like you know what is the cause for this menorrhagia there's a increased surface area for the endometrial tech tissue to grow that's the one reason the second reason i can say the second reason i can say is that see during menses during menses the uterus like you know once the like you know the, there is this shedding once there is this shedding of the uh, this uh, endometrium uterus will contract and because of this uterine contractions this expulsion of this endometrium is going to happen okay well and good but what and all the bleeding blood vessels what and all the bleeding blood vessels are there they will be ligated okay what i'm trying to say is during menstruation there are this uterine contractions because of this uterine contractions whatever the bleeding blood vessels are there they will be ligated okay why because there is a, we all know that there is a living ligature inside the uterus and because of this uterine contractions the bleeding blood vessels are clamped down just let me ask you one thing if there are these kind of abnormal structures if there is this kind like you know if there are these kind of abnormal structures inside this uterine wall do you think that uterus is going to contract properly absolutely no so if the uterus can't contract properly do you expect that these bleeding blood vessels will clamp down no so during menses because of non proper contraction of the uterus that will cause a menorrhagia now there is one more like you know reason why there can be a menorrhagia one more reason can be see uh, let me show you a uh, uh, image something like let me draw you an image now see this is a uterus uterine cavity if there is a submucous fibroid okay well and good now if there is a surface ulceration if there is an ulceration happening to this fibroid see fibroid is a vascular structure if there is ulceration to this a fibroid now what happens guys now there can be a bleeding from this ulceration and that bleeding can cause a menorrhagia so all these are the reasons for the menorrhagia please concentrate what and all the reasons increasing the surface area yeah increasing the surface area that's one reason this fibroid it acts as a foreign body and doesn't allow the uterus to contract properly and that causes that causes menorrhagia true and one more reason is a surface ulceration of a submucous fibroid okay surface ulceration of submucous fibroid that can account for the menorrhagia okay well and good now what about the pain if you have if a, if a female is having fibroid means then do you expect that she is going to have pain so usually pain is very much uncommon with a fibroid and if at all there is a pain if at all there is a pain uh, that pain may be due to the uterine contraction severe uterine contraction see inside the uterus there is this fibroid and this fibroid it's acting as a foreign body and uterus doesn't want this foreign body to be place inside the uterus so what uterus is doing it's contracting 
to kick out this foreign body at uh, during this uterine contractions the female can feel this pain so uh, due to uterine contractions she can have a pain and due to pelvic congestion okay she can have pain and degenerations like you know we are going to discuss in the next slide like you know on the upcoming slides that these fibroids they can undergo degeneration and the degeneration of these fibroids can cause pain and torsion like you know because especially with the pedunculated fibroids subserosal pedunculated fibroids see especially the subserosal pedunculated fibroids as they are having this stalk they can rotate like you know they can rotate on their stalk and cause torsion torsion of this fibroid can cause a severe pain so a torsion may be a cause for the pain in these females and compression these uh, fibroids they can be compressed okay and they can compress the surrounding organs or they compress by themselves and that causes the pain and sarcomatous change what does it mean by sarcomatous change guys sarcomatous change means that they are turning into malignancy so these fibroids which are benign in nature they are turning into cancers so sarcomatous change sarcomatous change is a, the one which causes the pain so important point sir again i am repeating uh, i know i am repeating but these are very much important most of the time fibroids are asymptomatic if at all there is a symptom the most common symptom is going to be menorrhagia pain is a less likely symptom okay now let's continue with the infertility now infertility it accounts for 3% only 3% of the cases means very less like you no know, less chances of getting infertility just because of this fibroids now why there is this infertility why means see if there is a submucous fibroid which is a very bad fibroid see out of intramural submucous and subserosal fibroids the very bad fibroids are submucous fibroids why because they distort the cavity shape okay they distort the shape of the uterine cavity so if you want to get a pregnancy if you want to have a proper implantation then your uterine cavity shape should be something normal if a fibroid if it is distorting the shape then that hinders the implantation so that can cause infertility yes these fibroids these fibroids they may occlude the they may occlude the fallopian tube so that it will be a hindrance for the passage of the sperm into the fallopian tubes and that causes infertility so please remember that the cases of infertility are very less and the infertility is because of the distortion or occlusion of the fallopian tube or the endometrial cavity like you know the endometrial cavity by submucous fibroid may prevent the implantation something important now after this let's discuss about the pressure symptoms see what are these pressure symptoms now these fibroids they are compressing the surrounding structures they are compressing the adjacent organs so that causes the pressure symptoms now let's see what are the pressure symptoms guys now anteriorly on urethra what does i mean by a fibroid which is compressing the anterior urethra or it can even compress the bladder so a female is going to have if this fibroid if it's compressing the urinary bladder anteriorly the female is going to have urinary frequency okay urinary frequency and she might also have urinary retention both are possible both are possible okay so anterior fibroids are associated with the urinary frequency as well as retention but most commonly urinary frequency is the better answer and posterior fibroids especially posterior cervical fibroids they are associated with the urinary retention important okay so anterior cervical fibroids please concentrate guys here also i have mentioned that anterior cervical fibroids they are associated mainly with the urinary frequency but they can also cause urinary retention and posterior cervical fibroids they are mainly associated with the urinary retention okay if they are compressing the urethra they will cause urinary retention but if they are compressing the bladder that can cause a urinary frequency that's what i mean by if they are compressing this rectum if they are compressing this rectum so rectum is totally compressed so that causes that causes a constipation why because totally rectum is closed so that causes constipation if they are compressing this pelvic veins they causes the varicose veins and edema in the lower extremities true if they or like you know compressing the diaphragm if they are compressing the diaphragm like you no know, it's just a fibroid it's a, it's a see a fibroid can be as big as a football if it is that much big if it compresses the diaphragm that causes respiratory distress that can cause like you no know, dyspnea so dyspnea can be seen 
if it is compressing the git if it is compressing the git so digestion can't happen properly that can cause dyspepsia and distension of this like you know uh, the gut so these are all the pressure symptoms so what are all the symptoms guys menorrhagia is the most common symptom if at all symptom is there it's a menorrhagia most common symptom infertility can happen 3% of the time pain is very like you know very unlikely if there is a pain that may be due to degeneration or torsion or due to sarcomere change or because of the foreign body action and leading to uterine contractions and last important point is see fibroids they are present with the anemia why there is anemia why because there is too much amount of menses there is too much amount of heavy menstrual bleeding okay so that can cause anemia and this anemia is going to cause a fatigue okay this anemia is going to cause a fatigue in a female so this is a very much important a clinical a feature fatigue with anemia okay guys but i have already like you know discussed with you that which fibroids are associated with the polycythemia broad ligament fibroids okay so important now let's continue with the secondary changes in a fibroid so what does we mean by secondary changes means these fibroids will undergo degeneration there are different types of fibroids so they can undergo different types of degeneration so let's see what is the most common degeneration to happen <clears throat> they will ask you in the exam the most common degeneration is a hyaline degeneration so hyaline type see these are all the microscopic features these are all the histopathological features like you know hyaline degeneration so hyaline degeneration is the most common degeneration okay now let's continue you can have a red degeneration very much important they will be asking you in the exam red degeneration is most commonly seen in the pregnancy a pregnant female can have this red degeneration if she is having a fibroid and that to when in the second trimester so red degeneration is associated with the fibroid in the pregnancy important now there can be a myxomatous degeneration not that much important and there can be a cystic degeneration important is the cystic degeneration is most common in the post menopausal women cystic degeneration post menopausal women now calcific degeneration important so calcific degeneration or calcareous degeneration where the fibroid is getting calcified so this calcareous degeneration it is most commonly seen with the subserous fibroids okay so subserous fibroids they are associated with the calcific degeneration now important point is here if the fibroid is getting calcified it's almost getting like a stone so calcium stone so a stone is forming where in the womb that's a uterus so i can call it as a womb stone so womb stone is going to be seen with which type of degeneration calcific degeneration there is no doubt hyaline degeneration most common degeneration post menopausal women cystic degeneration pregnancy red degeneration second trimester so these are the important points you have to keep in mind and it can be a fatty degeneration now important points here to be noted are see if i am talking about the calcific degeneration see calcific degeneration is going to occur it's going to start from where as the surface of the fibroid is highly vascular as the surface of fibroid is highly vascular the calcium deposition is going to happen from the periphery so please concentrate calcification occurs from the periphery why because the periphery of the fibroid is more vascular now if you are going deep into the fibroid if you are digging deep into the fibroid there is less vascularity of a fibroid so please remember degeneration occurs from the center I repeatedly ask mcqs degeneration is going to start from the center because the center of the fibroid is less vascular calcification all the time begins from the periphery why because the periphery of a fibroid is highly vascular and the calcium which is present in the blood that's going to deposit in the periphery that's what the important point i mean by now important mcq is see we have seen different types of degeneration hyaline degeneration red degeneration fatty degeneration myxomatous degeneration different types of calcific degeneration we have seen different types of degeneration but there can be a sarcomatous change also so what does i mean by is a fibroid which is turning into a cancer now the least common secondary change the least common secondary change out of all the different types of changes it can undergo a degeneration or it can un even undergo a neoplastic change so out of all the secondary changes the neoplastic conversion is very unlikely so least common secondary change to undergo is a sarcomatous change 
how much percent less than 0.5 percent okay so most common degeneration is highly degeneration and less chances of turning into cancer how much percent 0.5 percent okay and that too in which age group women post menopausal age group women so in a post menopausal age group women these fibroids can turn into cancer okay so that's important and let's continue further now let's talk some more important point about the red degeneration guys red degeneration this is going to be seen in the pregnancy we have discussed and red degeneration is associated especially in the second trimester that's going to be seen in the second trimester and this is associated with the thrombosis of the blood vessel see a fibroid it have outgrown its blood supply means it's very big it have grown very big and it is not getting a proper blood supply why because it may be because of a thrombosis the blood vessels they got thrombosed and very less amount of blood is coming to the fibroid now if there is less amount of blood is coming to such a big fibroid now this fibroid is totally under ischemia this fibroid is totally under hypoxia now there can be a necrosis which is happening inside a fibroid so this is what is known as a red degeneration so red degeneration is seen in the pregnancy especially in the second trimester there is no doubt and that too it's a aseptic condition why it is a septic condition why it's a totally aseptic why because there is no microbial organism causing this this is just because of no blood supply so it is completely aseptic like you know it's completely aseptic condition or i can say it's completely aseptic infarction why because there is thrombosis of the blood vessels important mcq and like you know a very very important point here to be noted is presence with it presents with red degeneration presents with a fever acute pain in the abdomen vomiting leukocytosis and esr is elevated guys this is the keyword to identify it as a red degeneration see how they are going to ask you the question you know a pregnant female is there she is going to present to you in her second trimester and they will say this female is known to have a fibroid fibroid history pregnancy second trimester all this will make you to think it is red degeneration but it's not all the time true why because even there can be a torsion during pregnancy so how to differentiate a torsion of the fibroid during pregnancy with a red degeneration how means torsion of a fibroid will also present with the pain there is no doubt but if it is a torsion you are not going to have fever and leukocytosis this fever leukocytosis they are not seen with the torsion mcq but fever and leukocytosis they are going to seen with the red degeneration of the fibroid so in the second trimester there can be a red degeneration or there can be a torsion but if it is torsion no fever no leukocytosis if it is a red degeneration there will be fever and leukocytosis acute abdominal pain this nausea can be there vomiting and esr is elevated okay important mcq okay now what we have to do should we have to use antibiotics no no need of antibiotics why because it's not a septic condition it's totally a septic condition now is there is any need of myomectomy you need to remove this you need to remove this tumor absolutely no don't remove this tumor during the pregnancy no need of myomectomy you need to terminate the pregnancy no see it's a no need of no need to give antibiotics no need to do myomectomy or no need to do termination of pregnancy nothing is needed what we can do if there is fever you have antibiotics if there is so much amount of pain put her on painkillers so it's a conservative management mcq red degeneration is managed by like you know conservative therapy like you know we are going to give the conservative management for the red degeneration with analgesics and antipyretics never ever never ever operate the fibroid during the pregnancy so don't touch the fibroid during the pregnancy important mcq okay so these are the important points about the red degeneration okay after discussing important points about the red degeneration let's continue with the let's continue with the differential diagnosis of fibroids uterine polyps and adenomyosis now it's very much easy now everything is going to be down here please stay patient now so what exactly is a fibroid we all know fibroid is a myometrial benign tumor the myometrium like it's a monoclonal tumor of the myometrial cell we all know so what exactly is a polyp now so is the polyp is going to arise from the myometrium no polyp is not something arising from the myometrium 
if the endometrium is out growing and if it's out pouching endometrium see endometrium if it is out pouching or endometrial outgrowth then it is known as a polyp so fibroid is a myometrium polyp is endometrium so that's a very much important point okay now what exactly is this adenomyosis adeno in the name itself it is a gland adeno means gland meiosis means something problem in the muscle so what exactly is this adenomyosis adenomyosis means the endometrial glands they are growing into the uterine musculature means the endometrial tissue it is going into the uterine muscles so endometriosis we all know endometriosis means endometrium growing in a place other than the uterine cavity so endometriosis interna interna in the sense the endometrium is growing into the uterine cavity into the uterine musculature i mean so please concentrate the endometrial invasion into the myometrium this is what is known as adenomyosis now fibroids in which age group fibroids are going to be seen 30 to 40 years age group that's a reproductive age group or i can say 35 to 45 years that's a true no doubt now uterine polyps uterine polyps can be seen in all the age group uterine polyps can be seen in all age groups fibroids the reproductive age group and adenomyosis is going to be seen mostly in a elderly women that's not after 45 years that's a perimenopausal age so reproductive age group is fibroids polyps are all the age groups perimenopausal age group more than 45 is adenomyosis okay well and good now what are the symptoms if, if there is a fibroid most most of the time they are asymptomatic if they are symptomatic they can cause menorrhagia they can cause anemia they can cause fatigue they can cause infertility these are the symptoms of the fibroid now if there is this uterine polyp then what is going to be the presenting features now important very very important mcq for the exam see they are going to present with the intermenstrual bleeding okay intermenstrual bleeding means in between the menses intermenstrual bleeding will be there so please concentrate here guys this is an mcq intermenstrual spotting or intermenstrual bleeding without increasing in the size of the uterus what does i mean by usually if there is a fibroid means i have said fibroids can be as small as a lemon to as big as a football now if there is a fibroid means definitely that will increase the size of the uterus but usually polyps doesn't increase the size of the uterus okay polyps are not associated with increase uterus size you see you can like you can see here polyps they are not increasing the size of the uterus but you can see here the fibroids like you know they make the uterus much bigger in size okay almost um, like you know the uterus size will be a 20 weeks of gestation that's what i mean by so intermenstrual spotting without increasing in the size of the uterus is a hallmark for the uterine polyps it's a hallmark for the uterine polyps intermenstrual bleeding a key point to be noted okay well and good now, if it is adenomyosis it can cause excessive bleeding and there can be dysmenorrhea and there can be dyspareunia for 10% of the cases guys remember fibroids will never present with please concentrate here fibroids will never present with the dyspareunia what does it mean by dyspareunia dyspareunia means a pain during intercourse pain during like you know coitus so usually fibroids are benign they are not associated with the dyspareunia but dyspareunia can be seen can be seen with adenomyosis in 10% of the cases and adenomyosis is going to present with the secondary dysmenorrhea and fibroids yes dysmenorrhea can be seen dysmenorrhea means painful menses okay painful menses and that's a, a rare like you know uh, symptom of the fibroids okay well and good now what are the examination findings if it's a like you know if it's a fibroid uterus is non tender it's not a painful thing why because we have seen pain is very like, like less unlike like you no know, less common pain is very unlikely feature and fibroids increases the size of the uterus true and that too i have mentioned it increases the size of the uterus like an almost 20 weeks size of the gestation 20 weeks of the period of gestation it just equal to the size of a, a pregnant female uterus okay well and good and the increase in the size of the uterus is asymmetrical is it going to be a symmetrical enlargement no if there is a fibroid on one side there is going to be a bump on that side so it's a asymmetrical increase in the size of the uterus but polyps 
polyps are not going to increase the size of the uterus in polyps the size of the uterus is normal and that too the uterus is not going to cause any pain okay that's not like you know uh, is not going to present with any pain now but with adenomyosis please concentrate the uterus is going to be a tender why because there is invasion invasion of the endometrium into the myometrium there is a penetration that causes lot of pain and as like you know whole uterus like you know whole uterus is getting affected there is a symmetrical or globular enlargement of the uterus very very important point there is a symmetrical and globular enlargement of the uterus and almost the size of the uterus is going to be at 10 to 12 weeks of period of gestation what does i mean by which uterus is bigger in size fibroid uterus is bigger in size fibroid uterus can be as big as this much okay a female can have even this much amount of like you know uh, abdomen so like you know i'm saying stomach i mean by abdomen okay it's not actual the stomach so if a female is having fibroid means she is going to have a symmetrical enlargement of her like you know uterus and she is going to have a very big tummy okay a very big abdomen even adenomyosis you are going to have a bigger uterus but here the size of the uterus is not as big as a fibroid okay the size of the uterus is not as big as a, a fibroid the size of the uh, like you know the uterus will be somewhere between at 10 to 12 weeks but important mcq is the size will never like you know increase more than 14 weeks of period of gestation okay size will be never greater than 14 weeks of period of gestation now what is the investigation of choice the investigation of choice is a transvaginal sonography okay you are going to do a transvaginal sonography i am going to show you the images don't worry there we will see a fibroid inside the uterus now for endometrial like you know polyps we will do hysteroscopy why because see this polyp is present inside the uterine cavity so what we are going to do is we are going to put we are going to send a camera into the uterine cavity and we can see this polyp there is no doubt so for a polyp it is the hysteroscopy which is better and for fibroid it is transvaginal sonography and for adenomyosis see where exactly the problem is lying guys in adenomyosis the problem is lying inside the uterine wall so are you going to see something with the hysteroscopy no are you going to see something with the like no transvaginal sonography yes but the details are not going to be that clear but if you want to see something inside an organ see here there is problem inside an organ inside the walls so what is that radiological modality like no the radiological study which will do the cross section and will give you details of inside of the organ mri is very good so mri is going to be a investigation of choice for the adenomyosis so this is a very very important slide to differentiate whether it's a fibroid polyp or adenomyosis fibroids reproductive age group polyps all age groups and adenomyosis is going to be seen in the perimenopausal age group intermenstrual bleeding or intermenstrual spotting without increasing the size of the uterus polyps mcqs okay so let's continue further now how to differentiate a fibroid polyp and adenomyosis on ultrasonography you see if at all i have to do a ultrasonography please concentrate a fibroid is going to have isoechoic texture with myometrium why because fibroid is nothing but a part of myometrium okay it's a myometrial cell so it's going to have a similar texture just like you know the myometrium please concentrate here in this image this is myometrium and this is also fibroid so myometrium and fibroid they are equally iso like you know equally echogenic means isoechoic right? because they are made up of same material okay true but polyp are they going to be isoechoic with the myometrium no they are not isoechoic with the myometrium right? because a polyp is a endometrial outgrowth myometrium is a muscle so are they going to be similar no so not isoechoic with the myometrium now what about the adenomyosis adenomyosis is endometrium in the myometrium so there is endometrium there is myometrium endometrium myometrium so you can see a venation blind appearance what does it mean by venation blind appearance what you are seeing here there is a strip and there is like you know empty area there is a strip empty area something like that so you can see an anoic area an echoic area and an echogenic area an echoic area echogenic area an echoic area and echogenic area 
so this is totally heterogeneous heterogeneous means different different so different different appearances are seen there is no single uniformity there is a heterogeneous myometrium there is heterogeneous myometrium why because inside the myometrium there is this endometrium so heterogeneous myometrium is seen on ultrasonography with adenomyosis and what you can see is a venation blind appearance and with an endometrial polyp see this polyps they are like you know uh, like uh, there is this one like you know blood vessel which is giving the nutrition to this polyp and that blood vessel on like you know doppler ultrasonography will show you feeder vessel sign so important mcq is feeder vessel sign is seen with a polyp venation blind appearance seen with adenomyosis heterogeneous myometrium seen with adenomyosis so these are all important points now what about the appearance now a fibroid is going to be well circumscribed why why it is well circumscribed it's a very much round and you can simply like you know the the, the margins are going to be very sharp why because it is surrounded with a pseudo capsule mcq but with a polyp they are irregular in shape and poorly differentiated and with adenomyosis i have already like you know uh, like said you that there is alternating hyperechoic and anechoic area okay so endometrial and myometrial junction is ill defined so how it should be normally how it should be there should be see please concentrate okay let me show you here please see please see here now if this is the uterine cavity okay here should be endometrium okay here should be endometrium and this is the myometrium and there is a perfect demarcation between endometrium and myometrium but with adenomyosis what's happening this endometrium it is going into the myometrium so that junction between the endometrium and myometrium is lost so endometrial and myometrial junction is ill defined mcq and on ultrasonography if you are able to see a broad base okay if you are able to see a broad base see the base is very much broad okay because fibroids are going to be big in size they are not going to have a small like you know small base they are going to have a very big base so a fibroid is going to have a big base but with a polyp please concentrate how a polyp is going to be let me show you something like this how a polyp is going to be a polyp is going to be something like this so polyp is going to have a very narrow base so broad base should remind you think about it's a fibroid if on ultrasonography if you are able to see a very narrow base then it should you should think about a polyp so these are some important like you know uh, points to differentiate between whether it's a fibroid polyp or adenomyosis after seeing this differential diagnosis let's continue with the like you no know, uh, some uh, like ultrasonographic pictures we all know that investigation of choice for a fibroid is transvaginal sonography there is no doubt now see please concentrate here there is a fibroid which is a very well demarcated because of the capsule which is present around it and it is isoechoic with the myometrium we have discussed here you can see lots of lo different different fibroids which are present okay yeah we can see here and here also you can see two different fibroids okay so here also see the fibroid is having a very broad base very much big base is there and like you know a fibroid is coming into the uterine cavity this is a submucous fibroid you like you know the fibroid is coming into the uterine cavity submucous fibroid okay so these are some important transvaginal sonographic images for a fibroid now let's continue with the management of the fibroids so guys this is the place where you can again expect a fusion sure they will ask you how to manage a fibroid now let's let's start from here if it is a, a symptomatic fibroid it doesn't matter whatever is the size of the fibroid doesn't matter whatever is the size if it is a symptomatic it's not causing any problem why because you know most of the time fibroids are asymptomatic if it is an asymptomatic fibroid what we are going to do is a expectant management what does it mean by expectant management we are just expecting the fibroid to regress itself okay what we are going to do is we are just asking the female to come regularly for you know regular follow up we are just asking to uh, like you know go for that like repeated transvaginal sonographies every 6 months or every one year so regular follow up we are going to do in the expectant management now there are certain exceptions for this what are the exceptions guys asymptomatic fibroid doesn't matter whatever is the size 
do the expectant management. Now, if it is a perimenopausal or postmenopausal woman, even if it is a symptomatic fibroid, see, there are certain mild symptoms present. She is having a mild pain. Now, she is having, you know, a little bit extra hemorrhage is happening. You know, there is this menorrhagia happening. Now, in this perimenopausal age group women and postmenopausal age group women, even if the fibroid is symptomatic, then we are asking her to go for the expectant management. Right? Because we know in this age group, perimenopausal age group and postmenopausal age group, the fibroid will shrink. So, we are going to go for the expectant management, MCQ. Okay, MCQ. And even during pregnancy. See, during pregnancy, always do the expectant management. During pregnancy, never ever touch the fibroid. Okay, so during pregnancy, always do the expectant management. This is again MCQ. Okay, during pregnancy, don't touch the fibroid. Now, please concentrate that expectant management should not be done in which cases. There are certain cases where you should never do the expectant management. Where? If there is a sarcomatous change, See, you are doing like, you know, transvaginal sonography and like, you know, the like, you know, transvaginal sonographic findings, they are suggesting that this fibroid is turning into malignancy. Now, in these conditions, are you going to like, you know, do expectant management, expecting the fibroid to shrink its size? No. So, if there is a sarcomatous change, never go with the expectant management. If there is a torsion of the fibroid, if there is a torsion of the fibroid, it is going to cause very much pain. So, in these conditions, never go with the expectant management and if there is infertility or recurrent abortions. Now, usually infertility with a fibroid is very much less, less than 3%. Now, there is no other cause found. For the abortion in this females, for the recurrent abortion in this female, there is no other cause is found. And, or I can say, now she is infertile. Like, you know, she is having primary infertility. Now, you just don't find any cause. The only cause what you have found is, she is having a fibroid. Now, in these conditions, you can operate it. So, Infertility or recurrent abortions is an indication to operate. So, don't do expectant management or if there is a sudden increase in the size of the fibroid, if the fibroids they are like, you know, rapidly increasing in size, it is indicative that something wrong is happening. Okay, it is very much rapidly, rapidly increasing in size. Maybe it is turning into cancer. Now, in these conditions, are you going to do expectant management? Definitely not. So, these are the conditions where you are not going to do the expectant management. For example, let me tell you one thing. It's an asymptomatic fibroid. It's an like, incidental finding. You have incidentally found this fibroid in her and she doesn't know that she is having a fibroid. It's asymptomatic fibroid. But you are doing regular follow-ups. Now it is rapidly increasing. But it is asymptomatic. Are you going to like no conserve it or are you going to operate it? If it is rapidly increasing in size, definitely you have to operate it. No expectant management. Torsion, operate. Okay. Infertility or recurrent abortions, operate. So, this is one part of the slide. Now, let's go um, to the symptomatic management. If a fibroid is symptomatic, like you know, heavy menstrual bleeding, anemia, fatigue, okay, like you no know, pain. So, if it is a symptomatic fibroid, now we will see whether this fibroid is a submucous fibroid or intramural fibroid or subserous fibroid. If it is, if it is a submucous fibroid, means it's in the cavity. Now, it is a submucous fibroid and most of the fibroid is towards the cavity. Now, what we can do? Please concentrate here. If this is the uterus and what I am saying is, it's absolutely in the cavity. For example, this is a fibroid which is a pedunculated fibroid. Now, if it is absolutely in the cavity, it is very much easy to remove this fibroid via hysteroscopy. So, you can remove it by hysteroscopic removal. If it is type 0, type 0 means a pedunculated submucous fibroid. You can simply access the uterine cavity with a hysteroscope and you can remove it very much easy. Or if it is a type 1 fibroid, type 1 fibroid is a place where much amount of fibroid, much, much fibroid is in the uterine cavity. If much amount of fibroid is in the uterine cavity, then it is easy to remove from the hysteroscopic side, like you know, from, uh, via like you know, hysteroscopic uh, removal. So type 0 type 1 fibroids, submucous fibroids, we are going to remove it by hysteroscopy. Okay, well and good. Now, if it is intramural fibroid or subserous fibroid, how we are going to operate? 
Now in these conditions, we are not directly going to jump in for the surgery. We are not going for the surgery first initial. Why? Because these intramural fibroids and subserous fibroids, they are very much treatable with the medical management. So initially we are going with the medical management. If medical management is not giving the good results, then we are going with the surgical management. Okay. So now let's see the medical management first. Now, so this medical management, First, we are going to give the first tire agent, first tire drugs, you know, like no, uh, first line agents. What are these first line agents in the medical management? Guys, very important MCQ is that first line medical management drugs, they are going to decrease the bleeding. They are mainly, mainly going to decrease the bleeding, but they are not going to affect the size of the fibroid. They are not going to shrink the size of the fibroid. They are only going to decrease the bleeding. Menorrhagia, heavy menstrual bleeding. So, what are these agents? The agents like oral contraceptive pills, progesterone, like you know, containing intrauterine devices, and transexamic acid. Very, very important. They will ask you an MCQ something like this. All of the following agents decreases the bleeding, but does not decrease the size of the fibroid. Oral contraceptive pills, again, I am repeating. Oral contraceptive pills doesn't have any effect on the size of the fibroid. They only decrease the bleeding. Progesterone containing like you know uh, intrauterine devices and transexamic acid. This is the place where you will get a doubt. So using oral contraceptive pills is a risk factor for fibroid. Then how oral contraceptive pills are going to decrease the bleeding here. How means please concentrate guys. What exactly are the oral contraceptive pills? Oral contraceptive pills they are nothing but a combination of estrogen and progesterone. So oral contraceptive pills have estrogen and progesterone. Now you can ask me, sir, fibroids, they are because of this hyperestrogenic state and hyperprogesteronic, like you know, hyperprogesterone states. Now again giving estrogen and progesterone does not cause the fibroid to grow. No, studies have shown, like you know, usually logically we will think that this estrogen and progesterone may increase the size of the fibroid, but no. That's the reason why previously I have said OCPs don't have any effect on fibroid, especially size of the fibroid. So studies have shown that given oral contraceptive pills doesn't increase the size of the fibroid and important point is this oral contraceptive pills, especially estrogen and progesterone both together, they are more progesterone like you know progesterone like you know acting. What does I mean by? Oral contraceptive pills, though it contain estrogen and progesterone, they act more like a progesterone. Now, how this is going to be helpful in bleeding? Progesterone, it stabilizes the endometrium. It doesn't allow the endometrium to shed. So, if it is stabilizing the endometrium, it's causing decidualization of the endometrium. That's something good. So, endometrium is not getting shedding out. So, it decreases the bleeding. Good. So, you can use oral contraceptive pills or you can use progesterone containing intrauterine devices why because if you are giving if you are like you know if you are keeping this intrauterine device that is releasing progesterone like you know levonorgestrel containing intrauterine device like merina it is releasing progesterone 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 and that progesterone is stabilizing the endometrium and that endometrium is not going to stay shed and that decreases the bleeding something good and transexamic acid is a non-hormonal like you know non-hormonal agent which is also associated with the decreased bleeding Okay, so these are the important points to be kept in mind. So OCPs, though they are estrogen and progesterone containing, they do not increase the size of the fibroid. They rather decrease the bleeding, okay, because of progesteronic action. Now let's talk about the second tire agents. Now you are giving the first tire management, like you know, you are giving the medical therapy with the first, like you know, first line agents, but the bleeding is not getting controlled. Then you can jump to the second tire agents. Also remember guys, very important MCQ, if a female, if a female is having the pressure symptoms like constipation, dyspnea, like a urinary retention, urinary frequency, if a female is having this pressure symptoms, then directly start the second line agents MCQ. If bulk symptoms are present or like you know, this pressure symptoms are present, directly start with the second tire agents MCQ. Now, these second tire agents, they are associated with the decreased bleeding as well as decreased size. 
first tier agents only decrease bleeding but the drugs which we are going to discuss right now they are going to associate with both decrease bleeding as well as size so what are they so gnrh antagonist so what are this gnrh antagonist normally please concentrate the gnrh gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to release from the hypothalamus it's going to release from the hypothalamus this gnrh is going to come to the anterior pituitary now in the anterior pituitary if gnrh is acting on the gonadotropes then what i am going to have is fsh and lh and this follicle stimulating hormone we all know it stimulates the ovarian follicles and it helps in the development of ovarian follicles so that developed ovarian follicles they are going to produce the estrogen okay and this estrogen is causing our fibroids so now what i am going to do is i am going to use gnrh antagonist okay gnrh antax now if i am using this gnrh antagonist like cetro relix relix group of drugs they like they are just going to block the gnrh receptors so that there is no activation of the lactotrope so that there is no fsh there is no estrogen and that decreases the fibroid size right? because estrogen is not coming if estrogen is not coming there is no nutrition for the fibroid to grow so it will shrink in size once if the fibroid is shrinking in size automatically that decreases the symptoms of fibroid that the menorrhagia can automatically get treated so decrease in size automatically treats menorrhagia so that's how we are going to use some gnrh antagonist or we can use gnrh analogs like you no know, this is a very much important point see usually gnrh no just tell me what gnrh is doing gnrh acts on gonadotropes in the anterior pituitary and it helps in the production of fsh and lh there is no doubt and this fsh helps in the development of the ovarian follicles and this ovarian follicle is going to make the estrogen for me okay now how giving gnrh analogs is going to decreasing the size of fibroid mcq how fibroid size is decreased by using gnrh analogs how means normally in a human body this gnrh is released in pulsatile doses it is released in pulsatile doses okay in a regular intervals but if you give depo preparations what does i mean by continuous gnrh stimulation continuous see continuous stimulation is not going to make you anything so if you are giving this gnrh analogs continuously the whole like you know axis the whole pathway is going to be inhibited so continuous gnrh stimulation will down regulate the pituitary will down regulate the fsh will down regulate the estrogen production if estrogen production is getting down automatically the fibroid size is going to decrease so that decreases the fibroid size as well as the menorrhagia so gnrh analogs depo preparation should be given like luprolide our aromatase inhibitors can be given like letrozole if you inhibit the enzyme aromatase peripheral aromatization is not happening there is no peripheral aromatization androgens are not getting converted into estrogens that's something good or you can use like you know anti progesterons anti progesterons can be used why right? because it's a progesterone dependent tumor right so like you know drugs like mifepristone mifepristone and ulipristal they can be used why because they are causing anti estrogenic action and that anti estrogenic action can also decrease the size of the fibroid that's something important or you can use like you know androgen drugs see this danazol the last stage which i am going to show you like you know which i have like you know uh, giving you here the danazol it's not estrogen it's not a progesterone but it's a androgen androgen it's an androgen it's an androgen with anti estrogenic properties as it's an anti estrogen that's something good for a fibroid here so all these are the second tier agents you can start with the first tier agent you can go with the second tier agent now still still if the fibroid is not getting you know operated like not operated if the still if the fibroid is not getting treated properly if the symptoms are not getting relieved then what we can do is go with the surgery you can go with the surgery what if the family is not completed now if the family is not completed means then what we are going to do is laparoscopic or abdominal myomectomy so what is this laparoscopic or abdominal myomectomy guys we are doing the myomectomy where the muscle is getting removed muscle in the sense that tumor okay this tumor is nothing but a muscle right so we are going to remove this tumor that's what is known as a myomectomy guys please remember that type 2 submucous fibroids intramural fibroids and subserous fibroids so type 2 submucous intramural fibroids and subserous fibroids they are going to removed by 
abdominal myomectomy or laparoscopic myomectomy why because please concentrate type 0 and type 1 submucous fibroids we have already removed it by hysteroscopic removal okay if it's a type 0 or type 1 it's very easy we can remove it by hysteroscopy if it is a type 2 it's much into the wall then we are going to go with the laparoscopic or abdominal myomectomy now important point is if you want to go with a laparoscopy minimally invasive if you want to go with a laparoscopic myomectomy then the uterine size these are the criteria then the size of the uterus should be less than 17 weeks size if it is a less sized uterus then you can go with the laparoscopy or if it's a very big uterus 24 big size uterus in that conditions you should go with the abdominal myomectomy and the number of fibroids should be less than five okay the number of fibroid should be less than uh, five to do the laparoscopic myomectomy so these are the important points to be kept in mind and the image what i am showing you here is a myoma myoma screw so what is this myoma screw guys see when you are when you are performing the laparoscopic myomectomy or abdominal myomectomy see this is the tumor you are going to live you are going to drill this a myoma screw into the uh, like you no know, fibroid and you are going to give a traction to remove this fibroid from underlying myometrial bed you are going to give a traction with this instrument known as myoma screw okay guys so we have discussed all the management options even for the fibroid now one important point please concentrate here like please see in the top that you should always do you should always do semen analysis of the partner before managing a fibroid before operating a fibroid see we are like totally doing the like you know this surgical operation based on whether the female uh, like you know have completed the family or not completed the family not completed the family in the sense she is she is willing to have a future children so for that her partner should be like you know uh, have the potentiality to make her pregnant so always check whether the partner like you know a semen analysis is normal or not so always semen analysis should be done like you know in, a, in her partner before operating a fibroid so based on that we can take a decision if, if he is infertile if he is like you know if he is infertile then what is the like you know uh, like what is our aim to like you know uh, preserve the pregnancy so there is like you know if her partner is totally infertile there is no need to preserve her pregnancy so we can tie directly the total abdominal hysterectomy something like that so this is the reason why always you have to do the semen analysis now after this let's continue with the embolotherapy so some important mcqs are being asked from this embolotherapy what exactly is this uterine artery embolization so embolization means we are okay we are intentionally like you know keeping this polyvinyl alcohol or gel foam into the uterine artery so this uterine artery it is getting blocked by these chemicals okay so if the uterine artery is blocked by these chemicals there is a decreased blood supply to the uterus and even to the fibroid see this fibroid is not getting proper amount of blood supply now if it's not getting proper amount of blood supply there will be ischemia hypoxia and there will be necrosis of this fibroid so that causes the decreasing the size of the fibroid this is something good even if you want to operate on the fibroid this can be done prior to the surgery why because it greatly reduces the size of the fibroid and also important point is see it, it shrinks the fibroid volume by almost 50 percent and the menorrhagia can be very excellently treated and in almost 90 percent of the females the menorrhagia is automatically controlled so these are some like you know uh, like you know these are like you know get recent like you know advances where like you know we are operating the fibroid with the this kind of techniques embolotherapy embolizing the uterine artery decreasing the blood flow to the fibroid that shrinks the size of the fibroid and automatically menorrhagia can be treated in almost 90 percent of the female so it can also be used preoperatively to decrease the size of the fibroid as well as to decrease the blood loss during the surgery if it's a small fibroid small blood loss so that's a very important point to be kept in mind now let's see a clinical scenario if there is a pregnant female okay there is a pregnant female and she is having a history of fibroids now she is a pregnant almost she is going for the like you know a delivery now she is eight months old for example now she is a pregnant of eight months old now she is having fibroids i know that she is having fibroids now what i have like you know done is now i'm asking her 
to go with the like you know, because of some reason because of some reasons i am asking her to go with the elective cesarean section now what she have said doctor you are asking me to go for the elective cesarean section okay i will go with that okay i am agreeing with that but whenever you are doing the c section also try to remove my fibroids she is asking me okay so there is a pregnant female with the history of uterine fibroids and now she is going with the elective c section can we operate the fibroid so like you no know, sh shall we operate this fibroid shall we do this uh, myomectomy at this time like you know at the time of this uh, c section never never operate the fibroid even during delivery never touch the fibroid why why we should never touch the fibroid it's because see just doing cesarean section is uh, like you no know, uh, very much like you no know, risky thing why because during cesarean section there is lots of uh, blood loss almost you know one liter of uh, blood loss will be there okay during cesarean section there is very much blood loss 1000 ml and i know that uterus is a highly vascular structure it's a highly vascular structure especially during the pregnancy it's highly vascular and if i am trying to cut a muscle that causes heavy bleeding already there is a bleeding because of the c section and if i am trying to operate this tumor there will be so much so much so much blood loss and that can kill the patient that can take the patient to the shock and that the patient will die on the bed so never operate never perform myomectomy during c section due to the risk of heavy bleeding but you can operate certain type of fibroids which fibroids the only fibroids you can think about at least you can think about to operate are subserosal pedunculated subserosal pedunculated why why subserosal pedunculated fibroids can be operated because please concentrate if this is the uterus this is the uterus how a subserosal pedunculated fibroid looks like a subserosal pedunculate means it is subserosal means outside the uterine cavity and it is pedunculated see this is the peduncle and it this is the fibroid now it is having a very narrow base here this type of fibroids are having a very narrow base this pedicle is like you know a very like you know uh, it just like very thin now what i can do is i can clamp down i can put a clamp here so that there is no blood loss and i can resect this tumor so the only fibroids which can be operated during c section are subserosal pedunculated and this can be operated the rest of the fibroids never ever touch that causes so much amount of bleeding and that kill kill the patient now let's see some important single liners which are especially important for the like you know um, fng fmg exams okay so these are like you know like you know every time they used to ask one kind like you know one mcq from me here what is the most common fibroid i have said to start with all fibroids are going to start as intramural fibroid so in most common variety of a fibroid is intramural fibroid okay now fibroid with the maximum symptoms which type of fibroids maximum symptoms means very bad fibroid it is a submucous fibroid so submucous means in the uterine cavity so uterine cavity it's a very much like you know protective area that's the place where the baby should grow if in that place if fibroid is growing means it's getting more protection kind of thing think like that so it is doing lots of nonsense and it's going to cause maximum symptoms like infertility it can cause it can cause menorrhagia it can cause pain lots of stuff that, that's the place where it can even undergo sarcomatous change so a fibroid with the maximum symptoms is submucous fibroid now in the beginning all fibroids begin as intramural fibroids there is no doubt most common fibroid to undergo malignant transformation malignant transformation who is a bad fibroid it's a submucous fibroid so answer is submucous here now torsion is most common in which fibroids will undergo torsion to undergo torsion it should have a stop so that is sub serous sub serous pedunculated so sub serous pedunculated fibroids will undergo torsion now inversion of the like you know uterus you try an inversion you try an inversion is going to be seen with which type of fibroid please concentrate if there is a uterus something like this and if you expect a big fibroid over in this area and that big fibroid will drag the uterus uh, drag it the uterus downside that will cause uterine inversion okay so fundal fibroids fundal okay fundal fibroids so fundal fibroids are associated with the uterine inversion so fibroid causing maximum abortions who is a very bad fibroid again it's a submucous fibroid submucous fibroid why because it's in the uterine cavity uterine cavity means it is not allowing the sperm to go into the fallopian tubes 
the submucous fibroid they are going to be like you know uh, cause hindrance for the implantation to occur so submucous fibroids are the fibroids which are going to cause the maximum abortions what's the wandering or parasitic fibroid i have already discussed that type a type 8 fibroids are wandering and parasitic fibroids where the fibroid have detached whereas subserosal fibroid see whereas a subserosal pedunculated fibroid have detached from the uterine wall now it is going into the abdominal cavity or pelvic cavity and there it's getting lodged onto the omentum or it's getting lodged onto some other structure and there it is growing so wandering or parasitic fibroid is subserosal pedunculated fibroid associated with the maximum urinary symptoms see if it is anterior cervical fibroid it is going to be associated with the urinary frequency if it is a posterior cervical fibroid it is going to be associated with the urinary retention now what are the most common presentation what is the most common presentation it is going to be asymptomatic fibroids will be most of the time they are asymptomatic if at all there is a symptom what is the most common symptom it is menorrhagia okay menorrhagia or heavy menstrual bleeding heavy menstrual bleeding so you can see all the answers here okay all answers were given here now please concentrate that a fibroid during pregnancy see during pregnancy we should not operate a fibroid okay well and good but having a fibroid during pregnancy it is going to be a risk factor for many conditions this is something bad why right? because you need to have a baby not a fibroid so baby will have fibroid something not good so a fibroid during pregnancy it increases the risk of postpartum hemorrhage why because we all know having a fibroid the uterus cannot contract after the delivery of the baby we all know that uterus should vigorously contract so that clamps down the bleeding blood vessels if there is this fibroid uterus is not going to contract properly so there is a risk of postpartum hemorrhage with the fibroids mcq now it increases the risk of abortions yes true fibroids increase the risk of abortions that to submucosal fibroids are associated with that now these fibroids they are associated with the preterm labor true having a fibroid can cause malpresentation why because you know uh, there is not enough space for the baby to properly orient itself so the baby is not presenting properly so there can be malpresentations and there can be the risk of abruptio placenta mcq they will ask you all of the following conditions are going to be associated with a fibroid fibroids increases the risk of abortions true fibroid increases the risk of postpartum hemorrhage true fibroids increases the risk of preterm labor true fibroids increases the like you know malpresentations true so all of these conditions are seen with the fibroids now we have discussed all the important points now let me show you some images like you know if she is having a fibroid means then she the female with a fibroid uterus she is going to have a very big tummy okay let me show you some images please concentrate here how big the abdomen is how big the like you know her abdomen is it's going to be very big it's not all the time true there can be as small as this much size fibroids okay if she what what i'm trying to put into your mind is a fibroid can grow this much big a football size big this much fi this much size fibroids can be there and even like you know the ovarian cancers present something like this you know if a female is having ovarian cancer means then she is going to present with this big tummy okay so please concentrate here now you can see a broad ligament fibroid okay a broad ligament fibroid which is almost a 15 kg you can see here like you know different sizes of a fibroid okay a female is having different sizes of a fibroid see so, so, so many fibroids are there okay now like you know it's 15 kg is not a big thing why because there are like you know evidences there are like a, uh, like a, these records almost the world's biggest fibroid is almost something around 63 kg okay 63 kg fibroid can be growing inside the uterus so these are some important images just to give, to give you an idea so hope the lecture is helpful thank you